Hi, my name is Chief Constable Andy Rhodes. Uh, I'm the Chief of Lancashire Police uh, in the northwest of the UK. Uh, and I've also been doing a lot of work nationally around trauma-informed practice and ACE awareness. My talk today is basically to introduce three amazing case studies, speakers from uh, Wales and Garda, who are going to talk about studies that they've done around ACE and how they're using trauma-informed practice also as a model of change. I've talked previously about system leadership, particularly across agencies that work with vulnerable groups of people and how challenging that can be. So my introduction today is going to talk about how language is very important to find common ground with other leaders of other organisations within our system. I'm also going to talk about how starting with our own people who work in our agencies and our organisations who often have a trauma-heavy workload, experiences at work that are very difficult for them to deal with, and often bring ACEs themselves into the workplace, sometimes consciously, sometimes subconsciously. And how starting with them in terms of workforce development can actually really accelerate some of the change and the cultural change across the system so that we all understand the lived experience of the people that we are out there trying to support day to day. And then I'm going to talk about um, you know, the sort of things that I think the mindset shift ACEs and trauma-informed practice can bring to people who work on the front line of our services. So the first thing that I always start with is, you know, when you're talking to leaders from other organisations, they've all, you know, we've, 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 we can all find, maybe we've got different objectives, we've got different challenges every day, we're all spinning plates, but we can all find a shared purpose, the why question, and starting with the why question, I found with leaders in other organisations is a very powerful way to open up a conversation around things like ACEs and trauma-informed practice. Because my experience of this conversation is that many senior people at executive level in big organisations are concerned that this is going to increase demand on already stretched services. That's a legitimate uh, concern that they might have because if we're overwhelmed with demand and let's face it folks we're all very very busy anyway worrying about unlocking new demand can be a real concern for people and I think that's why it's really important to get this conversation out first this is something that I think is really important to recognize in a lot of frontline staff in critical services that they are working in a really difficult environment and they're experiencing suffering and loss on a daily basis. They're experiencing really tough intergenerational poverty, exploitation, sometimes violence. Uh, and, you know, it's heart-wrenching, isn't it, for those people who work at the front end of our organisations. I've been there, I've experienced it. I know that the impact it can have on my mindset it can make my mindsets become quite defensive at times. And certainly risk aversion is a problem that all, all organisations that work in this space have to tackle. Why it's important to understand the policing brain. The police work frontline, often the first people to respond to people in crisis, people struggling because they are being abused, they've been exploited, you know, children in child protection jobs. And over time, a defensive sort of mechanism can kick in. And your worldview can change very quickly when you join the police. Pejorative, pessimistic and permanent. This is a really troubling mindset for many of us who work in frontline services in this area. And it can mean that we lose a lot of our meaning with our work. It can make us feel that we're not achieving anything on a day-to-day -day basis, and we can also suffer from compassion fatigue. In the right, bottom right-hand corner of this slide is the, the sort of model for positive psychology. If you look in there, positive emotions, engagement, relationships, meaning and accomplishment, sometimes our work can be the antithesis of that. So I think when we're developing trauma-informed practice, when we talk about ACEs, we're also seeking to regain our compassion and increase our meaning and achievement at work 
because that is something that's fantastic for the lifeblood of our organisations. And it's something we all start with, but can be lost in the world um, that we work in. So let's start with ourselves, know thyself. Our brains are all wired up the same way. Some of the most successful ACE awareness programmes that I've seen, um, ACE recovery work, trauma-informed practice, starts with looking at ourselves. If you work in an organisation that experiences a lot of trauma, actually tapping into your, your workforce using CPD to say, do you realise and let's talk about and explore what impact that exposure to trauma is having on your brain. And then you make the link directly to the client groups that those people work with, because we all share the same brain processing. And it is a very similar experience, and there's a similar impact on our brains from experiencing high-level levels of trauma in our work, um, as well as looking at people experiencing a high level of trauma in the areas like ACEs, you know, so that, that is something that I think I have seen. Um, pretty tough groups of frontline police officers go light bulb moment when they've started thinking, yeah, that's how I've started to see the world. That actually does happen to me, hypervigilance. Yeah, I do find it difficult to pay attention to things outside of the work environment and the levels of stress that they experience. I think that is a real opportunity. Done in a safe and supportive way, it's a great avenue in to introduce your workforce to trauma-informed practice and ACEs. The power of lived experience, I cannot underestimate this. We know and all the great programmes that we talk about uh, around ACEs and trauma-informed practice, place people who are confident enough to talk about their lived experience, for example, as victims of child sexual exploitation, of abuse, of being trafficked, and sit down in front of frontline practitioners to share their experiences. Again, in a safe and supportive environment, I have spoken to police officers with 20, 30 years experience who've said, I didn't know that that person I was taking home to their family when they were missing from home, I was taking them home to be abused. And when, 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 that is com when they're confronted with their lived experiences, the live cases in the places they work with the people that they've got experience of, it can really be a massive wake-up call in terms of changing the conversation. So that we, you know, we start to realise and we start bringing meaning back into our work that one little conversation can change things forever. I know numerous people who are recovering from a life of alcohol and drug addiction, who had horrendous abuse in their early lives. The people that I've chased around um, in my earlier service, arresting them for burgling houses. And I know that the things that change their lives are conversations. May have been somebody, um, a prison officer who spoke to them with some respect. It may have been a police officer. I know one person who said one conversation with a police officer at the right moment, change the course of their life and, and help them access the support they needed. You change your language and you change your thoughts. So I think this is about, as a system, the leadership of, the, of our organisation starting to change our language and starting to enthuse our people and bring back into their, their working lives meaning and achievement which is what they all joined the job to do. So I put this slide together. Uh, on the left-hand side, I think this is what we can achieve as organisations. This is around our culture as well as every individual. We move from judging from what, on based on what we see today to understanding how you got here. We move from losing our meaning, of, of, of meaning and purpose to understanding that actually, even though we may be having a 1,000 conversations a week, Maybe just one of those conversations is the one that's going to change someone's life. We move from thinking that we're surviving traumatic stress to a mindset where we are growing as a person because of our experiences with trauma. And we're looking at emotionally, rational, emotionally driven decisions, more rational decisions based on facts, data, and understanding 
the whole picture about a person's life rather than just what we are feeling and seeing at the moment we have the interaction with them. And we move from data overload to attention focus because a lot of our people are overloaded with data. So whether it's head or heart, there is a, an incredibly strong argument for organisations to adopt trauma-informed practice, looking at the social determinants of vulnerability, of crime, looking at the client groups that we work with very differently. That's not to say that we, still, we don't still do our job in policing, but there is a business case for this that is all about better decisions, reduced risk, improved motivation and development of our staff. The heart argument is there already, folks. I probably I shouldn't have to go through that with you, but I think quite a few senior leaders who um, are looking at the finances and the demand feel overwhelmed, and they often don't feel as though they've got a lot of heart in this, so you've got to appeal to the head and the heart. So the final slide from me is to tee up the presenters today uh, who all have uh, this incredible thing called data. It's not opinion, it's not all heart. There's a lot of stuff in here around these are facts, this is research, this is evaluation. It proves that we can do things very differently if we look at our work through a trauma-informed lens and particularly using ACEs as a conversation tool. So we've got Joe Hopkins and Sean Kelly from Early Action Together and the ACEs Hub in Wales. We've got Aoife Dermody from Quality Matters who's been working with the Garda Youth Services on early life trauma. And we've got Chief Superintendent Colette Quinn from the Garda Youth Division, who is looking at how trauma-informed practice can change culture and actually change the national youth justice system uh, in Southern Ireland. So fantastic presenters, folks. Really looking forward to hearing them. And thanks for listening to me. Thank you.